Why, hello everybody. I'm Henning from the internet. You may or may not have heard of me. I do quite a bit of writing and coding and whatnot. Uh, but I have little time and I'm not that interesting. What's more interesting is where I work. I work for a very small uh, web hosting company and domain registrar. And the reason why it's interesting to you is because we are big enough such that we need proper metrics and logging systems in place uh, to be able to even function. But on the other hand, we are, not, we are small enough that we, have, we don't have a team who does that for us. We have to uh, do it on the side. And it's just a side, one part of our work. And I think that makes it kind of relatable to you. At least I don't think that Google sent their logging team over here to learn something from me. So um, to make it more convenient for you, I made a page with all the links, all the concepts, all everything I'm gonna mention here. So uh, just relax and listen. And the agenda is three things, basically. I'm gonna talk about errors and how to get notified about them. I'm gonna talk about metrics and how to know what the hell is going on on your servers. I'm gonna talk about logging and how to centralize it and where you even need it. So one question I had, who is happy with their logging and metrics infrastructure? <laughs> Liar. <laughs> um, I'm not promising you happiness. It's computers after all. But uh, maybe we can, uh, I can make it, maybe I can provide you with functional unhappiness, which is nice sometimes. So, errors. I'm gonna start with them right away because they, they happen. You have to deal with them, and they are the quickest wins to make. So I'm starting with them while everybody is still um, still fully awake. Um, and again, I have three expectations from my error logging, uh, from my error notification system, and this is really timely notifies. I want to know right away when something happens. I want to be notified only once because this happens to people who just use an exception to email logger. <laughs> so. Uh, I'm Hinek and I had once 500 emails from such a thing. <laughs> so, and I would also like to have some useful context of my errors because monitoring may s tell you that something is broken, but this is not really helpful to uh, have any idea of what is broken, what's going on. So obviously there's a huge market uh, to solutions. I'm gonna talk about only one of them, uh, which is Sentry. Sentry has a lot of things going on for it, uh, most importantly, its owner and fam famous expert DBA, David Kramer, bought me a burrito once. So consider it as a, my full disclosure. But it's also open source software, and it's written in Python using Django. So if you're deploying Python services, you maybe already know how to deploy it. And if you don't want to do that, there's, um, there's a paid solution. Um, the plans are pretty affordable, I think, and there's also a free trial and uh, a free plan. So you can be up and running within seconds. So you sh if, you, if you don't have any uh, error notifications, you should try it out. So what do you get? You get instant useful notifications by email, but also by Slack or whatever you want. There are plugins for that. Or it contains a traceback and some metadata. And the most interesting button, of course, is the view on Sentry one. A nice touch I find is that those emails have a reply to header set to your whole, your whole team. So Maybe you're on a train and you see something that uh, exploded. You can just hit reply and give them some hints how to fix it. So um, the web interface offers much, much more. And my favorite button is this button because this button is telling me I've saved you 100 emails in your mailbox. So once you've fixed this exception, it gets marked as resolved. And if it happens again, it gets marked in a regression and you get your notification again. So basically, it does exactly what you want it to do. Um, as you can see, there's a lot more going on. There's a lot of metadata. It's, much of it is collected automatically. So you can think of it like the Django stack trace view that many people still are serving uh, to the customers, but it's just for you. <laughs> so how do you get your data in there? So the short answer is JSON over HTTP. Um, so you can use it with any language, any framework, even assembly if you want to go, go through scale. So there are nicer clients for various languages. They have usually the name Raven in it. And uh, the Python one supports both multiple transports, which is how those errors are delivered. So using GUM, the new async IO, Twisted, Request, and so on and so on. 
but also multiple integrations, which is basically um, how auto data is collected automatically without you doing it explicitly. So for example, logging. You install a logging handler and every exception that arrives there is forwarded to Sentry. You don't basically have to change anything in your code if you're logging errors. For Django, there's great support. There's uh, general whiskey support and nine more. Maybe it's even more since then, since I did the slide. So, but let's start simple. How do you do it when you love? And it's just like this. You instantiate a client using a URL you get from Sentry's web interface, and then you capture it. You're done. This is how you capture errors and report them into a, into a nice uh, interface. What I personally like is this. Um, for ad hoc tools, I, which you may or may not have a lot of in your operations, uh, every exception that is caught here uh, th that happens in this function gets forwarded to Sentry. So you, can, you don't even have to change your functions. You can just add a decorator to it and uh, your errors are caught and forwarded. Integrations make it even easier. I've already mentioned that uh, it is built on top of Django, so the authors know a thing or two about Django, so the support is the best, as far as I could tell. You add a single line, you get all uh, 500s reported, and you can import a client from anywhere. That's that. We are already done. Um, deploy Sentry or give David a few bucks so he can be buying me another burrito. Install Raven and add a few lines to your project. If you don't have error uh, notifications, and I really have to stress this, you are missing errors. Your customers are seeing those errors. You are not. You are losing customers. Get something done. And to make it even easier, David was nice enough to issue a nice promo code, which is, I think, 100 bucks. I'm not getting anything out of it, but um, if you want to try it, there you go. There you go. And there we go to metrics. What are metrics? Metrics are numbers in a database. That makes them a time series data, because they are associated with the time stamps. And they are basically the difference between guessing and knowing. Because if you want to make decisions, you need facts. I think it's an accepted wisdom. Uh, because otherwise, you spend weeks and months building something that's useless or even harmful. And metrics are those facts, so we will give them a quick roll. And I would distinguish between system and application uh, metrics. System metrics are something you observe on a server, like the load or how much traffic is going through. Very important, should be collected using something like CollectD, but not uh, really uh, part of my, my talk. What I'm talking about is app metrics, which is something you um, measure within your app. And the simplest uh, metric you can have are counters, which is something happens and you increase an integer, which is pretty fast, even in Python. So, then um, timers. Maybe you want to know how long your uh, database queries take. Maybe you want to know how long your requests take on average. And finally, there's gauges, which I find undervalued because they are really useful if you want to debug something. They are just numbers which you want to keep track of. So it can be the number of um, customers online or the number of connections in a connection pool, things like that. I find them super helpful. There are much more, but these three are, in my opinion, the most important one. So what can you do with metrics? So we said there are time series of data so you can plot them. And such a plot gives you a lot of uh, information that bare numbers don't. So for example, you see development over time. So you can tell that you are running at 99% capacity every day at 12 p.m. And if, if you don't do anything, uh, it might fall over next week when you get one more customer. And you also see trends. So you can tell if you need to buy the, uh, if you will have to scale out today, tomorrow, next week, or maybe never because you are losing customers because you don't have proper error handling. So, and you have graphs, you can correlate them so you can see like requests per second versus latency. How much requests per second can your server handle? And since they are just numbers, you can do math on them. So, for example, if you have a graph of a counter, uh, it's just a raising line, it's not really interesting. But you take the derivation of that and you have requests per second. Uh, if you have timers, uh, taking the average is not very useful, but percentiles are, are very interesting. So for example, what is the average request time for the slowest 0.01% of your customers? Because what if every 1,000 uh, requests takes one minute? You wouldn't know from the average because it gets smoothed out by the other 999. But this customer who gets regularly, for some reason, one, a one-minute request, he, he may leave you too. Um, thing is, math is hard. 
The average human has one ovary and one testicle, which is true, but it's not very useful information. <laughs> and you can do the same mistake with your system or your app metrics. So unless you know what exponentially decaying reservoirs are, use tools by people who do know what it is. So one other thing, you can also do monitoring on top of metrics, of course, because you can set a hard limit for acceptable latency. If, it's, uh, if the threshold is, is uh, exceeded, uh, ring the bell. Error rates. If you have a busy application, you usually have always some kind of errors. If they go out of whack, something is going on. And it's actually true for any kind of anomaly. If, uh, for example, benign errors like 404s or 401s go out of whack, there's something going on you should investigate. And there's actually a whole stack called Kale by Etsy that is just made for um, finding anomalies like that. So we've said um, they live in a database, but probably not SQLite. So what we are looking for are so-called time series databases, which have various features like special querying and everything. One of the most important ones is that uh, you have a roll up of your data. So you'd which means you have various resolutions of your data for the past, because you probably don't have enough storage to store um, a second resolution of all your metrics for the past year. That might get expensive really fast, even if you have big hard disks. So you, you usually smooth it out somehow. So you have like, you, you want to know what the average load was a year ago per day, but you want to know it very precise for the past hour. So, and I'm gonna introduce you to three. The first one is paid and host it, and it's really, really nice. You can get started immediately by, by using curl and uptime, and you have a curve of your load of your um, system. I've done that, we started it like that too. The graphs are beautiful, there's a lot of goodies, it's a lot of fun to work with it. If you want to host them yourself, uh, the current 800 pound gorilla is still graphite, which has been popularized by Etsy too, and it's written in Python. The front end is in Django, the back end is in Twisted, called Carbon. It's finally in Trusty, you don't have to build it yourself. And you can say that it's a widely supported standard nowadays. So the, the network protocol of Carbon is supported by other applications too, just for, um, just for compatibility. So the thing is, it is a little bit long on a tooth. So the storage configuration I just talked about, the roll-ups and limits, is a bit finicky. And it might be not the most pretty interface you've seen today. It's XJS, if you don't, didn't have the pleasure to work with it yet. And this is what happens when programmers build interfaces. I mean, it's open source software, so I'm not complaining, but it's clearly kind of a problem. But that one is solved by Grafana, which is something, that it's really just to build pretty dashboards for Graphite. And once you install it, you will probably uh, lose a few hours to it because it's so much fun to play with it and it looks so good. <laughs> and Grafana, also supports InfluxDB, which is the next generation time series database written in Go, because that's pro what you do nowadays. It has a company behind it that sells hosting, so let's hope they don't pull a foundation DB. And it is used by Heroku, so it's not an obscure toy for uh, nerds, but it is in production. It looks better, it's easier to manage its storage. Um, you can tag values which will anyone uh, appreciate who had ever put the server names into their uh, metrics names, as you've seen on the slide before. Now you don't have to can put any tag on a value and uh, have clean names. It offers a SQL-like query language to those metrics and a graphite front end, which means you can, if you're running graphite right now, you can point your tools just to InfluxDB and it should work, but it's computers, so I'm not sure. Um, if you start on today, I would recommend to look into it first. If you run graphite and are functionally unhappy only, then I would not abandon ship so quickly. It's not that big of a deal. So collecting, how do we get the data into these, those databases? And there are basically two approaches. The one is uh, that you aggregate externally. So something happens and you send out a, send out a UDP package to StatsD or protocol buffers to Riemann. Uh, StatsD is older, comes also from the Etsy ecosystem. Um, 
simple to use, simple to set up. Riemann is by a super smart person and it's configured in Clojure, so you probably have to be also super smart to use it. Um, the good thing is it has no state, it's super simple to set up and to use. The bad thing is you have no direct introspection. So you need at least one more service to even see what metrics are coming out of your system. In the case of StatC, you need even two because StatC uh, does only aggregation and then forwards it to Graphite. With Riemann, you get at least a kind of dashboard. So the second approach is that you aggregate your metrics within your application and then deliver it to your metrics database. This approach has been uh, popularized by Coda Hale and his talk, Metrics, Metrics Everywhere, which you totally should wa uh, watch if you want to get into metrics. It's super interesting, it's super funny to watch. Um, and this one gives you immediate insight into your, um, into your application. You get some kind of dashboard out of your application and um, this is useful both in development and in production just as well. Um, of course, you've got state, state is bad, state means bugs, but I personally prefer the second approach because it's more practical. So the question is how you do it in Python. So for StatC, there's a gazillion Python clients, pick one, um, you, they work all the same. You instantiate a client with a URL and you shoot packets around and don't look at return values because there are none, it's UDP, everything's gonna be okay or not because if your system is burning, UDP might not be the best way to uh, message your state. But So, the only known working solution to uh, in-app metrics to me is scales. Um, so it comes with a plethora of stats, but you have to set it up. Uh, these are the two I use most. The meter stat is for uh, something that happens per second, so basically a derived counter. And the PMF stat is a, is a timer, nothing else. So how do you use it? For metering, you just call mark on it, and for timing, it's, it is a, deck, um, a context manager where you do something inside of it and you're done. Now, by doing this alone, you get a nice uh, web dashboard out of the app. This is the metering you got already, uh, the average for the past minute, five minutes, and 15 minutes. Even nicer is the thing you get out of your timing because you get your percentiles for free plus some more um, nice statistics. And all this data you also get as JSON so you can collect it from using collect D or whatever. Uh, I personally use the uh, graphite periodic pusher that comes with uh, scales. You just define the period, how long it how often you should just send out the metrics and you're done. We are done. You know how to collect metrics and how to store them. Now we come to logging. Um, in an ideal world, we wouldn't be logging because uh, you want to know about errors, which we now have error uh, sentry, and you want to know the state of your system, which are metrics. So there are people like Armin Ronacker who just refuse to log anything. I personally cannot get away with that simply because we need it for some kind of bookkeeping because when a customer calls us, they always lie to us. They always say that they did not log into the server, they did not change that file. And we, have, we need a way to uh, double check what they are telling us. And um, that's usually not me. That's someone from support. And those people usually don't have don't have the SSH keys to our servers. So th this data should be somewhere searchable in a central place. So we are talking about centralized logging. And I can talk about centralized logging and not mention Splunk. And please might see there are more money bags next to the name than uh, on the other slides. It is for a reason because this is enterprise software. And it's not just one web interface, it's a versatile platform. They have literally an app store. It works both on premise and in the cloud. It's great if you can afford it, but it is enterprise software. So the homepage is full of PDF white papers. Um, there's a lot of webinars for you to attend if you're into that kind of things. So more down to earth, there's Paper Trail and Logly, which I have heard uh, good and bad things about both. So it's a matter of taste. Um, I'm sure you, you're gonna be reasonably happy with any of them if, if you choose and if you want to uh, save your log files on foreign servers, which I personally don't. And that's why we are running Elk. Probably heard about it, right? It's currently the most popular stack. 
and it consists of Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. And let me just quickly show you how that works together. So we have servers that are generating log files. Those log files somehow get into Logstash, which parses them, adds meaning to that, and saves it into Elasticsearch, which is a database uh, that is easily searchable and easily clusterable. And now the data is in there, you can view it using Kibana, which is a web interface to all these things. Um, yeah, and that's all, that's the ELK. There's a similar solution called Greylock. It also uses Elasticsearch for storage and search, um, but Kibana is only a view on Elasticsearch, but Greylock does more because, and I'm quoting here, uh, Elasticsearch is not a log management system. So overall, it's a bit more integrated, they do more, but I'm personally not particularly fond of having a Mac vendor in my uh, infrastructure. So you have to decide yourself. I haven't found a compelling reason to switch from Elk, but I'm sure there's someone. So uh, if you have any questions about Elk, uh, Hansa Kral is somewhere, probably in some pub here, and um, he works for, Les for Elastic, the company behind Elk, so he will be happy to answer all your questions, and he's also the maintainer of the uh, client to Elasticsearch. So, one more thing, Kibana is much more than just a web grab. They have a lot of nice things going on, like geo stuff and everything, so there's a lot of things to find. Now, let's come to the finicky part. How do you get your data into it? How do you produce it? So I'm gonna say this should be the goal for you. Uh, a timestamp and something machine readable with as much useful context as possible. Um, because that makes configuration really simple. You, you literally tell Logstash there's a timestamp and JSON, and Logstash will figure it out. Of course, it's just one line, but I thought you might find it more readable in that size. So, how do we get there? It's a matter of context and format. So, you want to log out everything important, and you want it formatted in a machine readable way. And if you tried it to achieve that with the standard tools, uh, you might found like I did, it's rather tedious. So I wrote something on my own called StructLock. Does anyone know StructLock? Okay, let's change this. <laughs> so StructLock is not a logging system. It's not a replacement for logbook. Uh, it's not a replacement for standard libraries logging. It's not. Instead, it gives you a bound logger that wraps your logger. So if you are gonna ask me, does StructLock work with X? The answer is yes. Um, now, it also gives you a context which you can bind key value pairs to it. And once you decide to log this, uh, this event out, this context you've saved before is combined with the new key value pairs to one event dictionary. And this event dictionary is run through a uh, chain of processors, which are just callables. A function that gets a, a dictionary in returns a dictionary, nothing else. The last processor, the return value of it is, is passed into your original logger. So if you're using the standard logging uh, from the standard library, you would return a string. So for example, a JSON string or whatever format you want. You can return XML for all I, all I care. Structlog comes with uh, JSON and key value pairs for that matter. So the thing about the processor is it's really cool because it's really just callable so you can do whatever you want. You can plug data out of it. You can collect metrics from your log, uh, log entries, you can report errors to Sentry from them and uh, enriched with the context you've collected. This is really nice. So this handles both context and format. And let me give you a few examples because it's a bit abstract. So simplest case, you get a logger, which is everything is pre pretty much configurable. And you can, now you can log using key value pairs. You, s you can stop writing pros. Uh, and if you're any, like me, I hated writing prose before, but it's what's even worse is parsing prose. So um, this output is completely configurable. This is the default, uh, which is just uh, key value pairs, which is human readable in, in development. So I find this is already a huge progress over uh, standard library, but you can do more. So, um, and this is incremental data binding. So again, you get your logger, and now you can just start binding key value pairs to that logger, and this log 
object is every, a new object every single time. This is immutable uh, data, and you have no mutable state at all. Ask your Haskell friends, that's a great property to have. So, in the end, everything you bound to the logger gets logged uh, along with the event. Again, output is configurable. And please notice there is, that you don't care at all how the data is represented within your, um, within your business, data, uh, business code. That's, that's something that you care about somewhere else, in a processor, or in your logging module, but not in your business uh, code. You just bind key values and just log them out. So, uh, now maybe even more practical, how do you use that in practice? So, this is a pyramid view, a very simple one, but it would probably work the same with any other. So, at the beginning, you bind a request object to your logger, and then you log something out, and how do you do something useful with that object? So you write a processor that extracts the data. So you try to remove the request from the uh, event. If there's one, so you've removed it, but you, now you, you add some data from the request, like the IP address of your client or the user ID of the user. And you return the new, uh, the new dictionary. And this is what you get out of it in case you have a JSON uh, formatter installed. Again, you did not care about what you want to log out in your view. That's something that you decide elsewhere. That's, so that's all I'm gonna say to Structlog. Uh, if you have any questions, just talk to me. Uh, I'm pretty proud of that one. Uh, now to something slightly sadder. Let's talk about standard library slogging. I'm gonna say this is all you should do and ignore all the rest. Just log to standard out and handle the logs outside. Because Unix had over 40 years to develop solid logging tools and there's absolutely no need for us Python people to reinvent the wheel uh, like date, stamping, that date stamping or um, log rotation. We are doing it worse, stop doing it. Just go to standard out. Um, also, I've heard that it's not that much fun to use. but you be the judge. So, um, now, you, now you have structured data on standard out. What do you do next? Well, send it into, into a file, or send it to syslog, or any other queue like Kafka. Um, pipe it into a logging agent like a log stash forwarder. You can do whatever you want, it's just a pipe. Um, I'm personally a bit paranoid, um, because I, don't lock a lot, but what I lock is important to me, so I don't want to lock, to lose any log entry. So, and no network in this world is as reliable as X4. So I save everything in a file, which this file is rotated uh, for 48 hours, and it's, uh, those entries are deleted, and I ship it off from there, from this file. So while I do not want to have to use grep, I still want to retain the reli re reliability of uh, grepping through files on a file system. So, let me put it all together. So I use struct.log to bind data to log things out. Struct.log makes it a JSON string, which goes into logging, and logging sends it to standard out. Now, I use run it to run my processes. It doesn't really matter what you're using, but run it comes with a daemon that will take standard out, add a timestamp to it, and write it to a file. Now, my, now it, my uh, log entry is safe. This file is watched by log slash forwarder, formerly known as lumberjack, and it sends to Logstash. Logstash parses it, saves it into Elasticsearch. Logging is solved. So, uh, yeah, we are done early. Let's get some pinchos. We are not. So, we have three nice components, but we forgot about the pragmatic part. So, how do you put those three things together uh, without making it gross? Because this is gross. You, you can barely see the logic hidden in the jungle of reporting, measuring, counting, and whatnot. So, I want it to look like this, which is much nicer. Something happens, I tell the log system about it, and I'm done. Of course, that's not always possible, but I would really try to hard, uh, really like to try hard to get somewhere there. So, with errors, it's pretty easy, I dare say. So, either use so, some handler uh, that comes with a sentry, either just logging or, if you're using, running Django, using the Django uh, app there, using, um, or just track log. That's what I do when I'm using a pyramid. I just pluck my errors out of, um, 
out of the logging stream and uh, I can drop entries if something is not interesting. And in web apps, there's all, usually also a way to define error views. And this is really, really cool because, again, pyramid, uh, you get the exception and a request object. Now, you, you serve back the error ID, which is served from Sentry. So now, when your customer calls you complaining about errors, they can exac exactly tell you the error ID, and you can look the error ID up, and you have the, the exception that the, um, that the customer saw. And this is so great that we've seen something that's even rarer than a white rhino, which is a happy Armin Ronacker. So, although I have to say, since I made this slide, he joined Sentry, so take it with a grain of salt. But still. So, on to metrics. Um, most metrics can be observed from the outside. And outside can mean outside of your views, outside of your app, outside of your server even. So, maybe look, let's have a look at uh, whiskey containers. The two major ones have both knobs that will help you with that. So, Geonicorn offers Stats T integration right there. So you add one command line option and you have average request times in your Stats D and in your Graphite. You don't have to change your code at all. Micro Whiskey, as usual, goes far, far further. They, of course, have Stats D too. They have direct carbon, AKA Graphite support. They have a whole metric subsystem, including nightmare inducing things like SNMP. So you get your stuff done with that. And with this, you get a big picture of, of the state of your application without even touching your apps. So, go for it. Then, you can write middleware. Middleware is no dark magic. Again, pyramid. Uh, this is a tween, which is a very awkward contraction of between. And this is called on every request that comes in. So you have the request object. In this, in this case, you just, we just uh, measure the time. But you can, of course, look at the data within the request object and start uh, splitting up your data uh, depending on the view or some argument that you're passing into your view. Probably don't have to because there are things like permit stats D that already do that for you, but you always have the possibility to do things from within your app but outside of your actual logic. Then of course you can extract data from logs. So because if you lock something out, you shouldn't have to also count it or measure it. So Logstash will do that for you. It supports all major metrics backends. Um, the, the drawback is that you have to change the configuration of Logstash, which may or may not be a problem for you. Um, it's not a really problem to me, but it adds friction, which I do not like, so I do not do that. I don't want to annoy those people who are responsible for that to fix it for me because I've added a new metric. Of course, you can do the track lock, that's what I do. Uh, you can just count events by their names and you already have something useful. Okay, finally, you can also leverage monitoring, which is even for the outside. Uh, any, any monitoring system has some support for metrics numbers. In the worst case, you just measure the time it takes to, to execute a check and save it. So you get a really external view of your data, uh, external view of uh, the behavior of your apps, um, which is not very precise, of course, but sometimes it's useful to see how your system feels from the outside boundary and not from within your um, availability zone or your computing center. Okay, so what, what's left? What do you have to do yourself? So if you want to measure code path, you probably have to uh, add some code to your business logic. For example, database queries. Or if you have certain major uh, use cases, like a view that sometimes uses only cache data and sometimes hits the database, it's not very useful to average those two numbers. Not to say it's completely useless. So you may want to split that up. And um, of course gauges, if you want to expose numbers from within your application, you will probably have to uh, touch your application in some way. And now we are really done. So what did we learn? Proper error logging is important. Sentry is awesome. Um, metrics are important. InflexDB is probably the future. Graphite is the present. Use whatever you want from those two. Met 
Um, centralized logging saves you a lot of pain, and maybe you even need it. Elk will have your back, Struclog will help you to get your data there. And now you know how to use all of them with Python without gross code duplication. So I hope everyone learned something. So go forth and measure, study the talk page, follow me on Twitter, and tell your German-speaking friends to get their domains from Vario Media. Thank you. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm not taking any questions because whenever I did, I completely misunderstood the question and said something very stupid. So if you have any questions, I will be outside. I'm here through Sunday. I will be at the sprints. I will be at lunch. Just chat me up. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. <laughs>